Welcome to With Love and Rage, the podcast of Extinction Rebellion NYC. Planet Earth today looks very different than it did just six weeks ago. A global emergency like the one we're going through disrupts the familiar world and turns life on its head. From this new perspective, it's clear that the way things were can change rapidly. Smog over cities has lifted, revealing clear blue skies, and car-free streets have made way for people and wildlife to roam. We can see right out our window that another world is possible. My name is Jonathan Menard. I'm a filmmaker and organizer with Extinction Rebellion. Today's episode is the first in a series of conversations recorded on Zoom in which members of Extinction Rebellion offer wisdom and insight on living with intention in the midst of uncertainty. This first segment was recorded with Jess Sorante, a life coach who supports climate activists through her Radical Support Collective. She leads active hope workshops based on the teachings of Joanna Macy, helping people process climate grief. She spoke with me from her home in South Brooklyn. I remember someone telling me years ago that one of the reasons people love to travel is that something changes in your brain when like there's so much new input that there's like this different kind of presence, right? So you're like taking in new information at, a, at a, such a higher rate that it forces you into being really present. And I've been thinking about that. I wish I could remember where I heard it or if it was true, but it kind of feels like that where it's like, I don't know my, my world, the things that I thought were stable and consistent in my world no longer are. And so everything feels really slow, but at the same time, I've been working as much as ever. <laughs> and I, I felt so busy, which has also been pretty disorienting when like a lot of people in my life have like all the time in the world and everybody wants to like hang out on Zoom and stuff. And I'm still like trying to keep up with all the promises I've made and all the work that I'm doing. And yeah. And at the same time, it all feels like, like it all blends together because I never leave my house. <laughs> We've been keeping a captain's log. So somehow we had the insight on the first day. Like, remember that there was that Wednesday night when Trump made the announcement, made some announcement. It was like his first public announcement about this whole thing or like to the address to the country. And then like the next Thursday, like everybody freaked out and the grocery stores were emptied out and all that. So that first day, we had already been in the house for about three or four days at that point. Oh no, we hadn't. No, that was like the first day, but still people were going out to bars and stuff over that, that weekend. Um, we started a little journal. And so I, day one, <laughs> March 18th, here's what we had for dinner. Here's what happened in the world. Um, and that's been like really cool actually to like track like, okay, wow, this is getting really boring to just like write about our everyday lives, but also to like be keeping some sort of tempo on um, how long we've been doing this and what's been happening. So what are you seeing and how are you experiencing this uh, pandemic unfold? What am I experiencing? Um, well, um, Today, I'm really sad. <laughs> um, and my next door neighbor passed away yesterday. Um, she was like in her 70s, I would guess. And she went to the hospital two days ago with COVID. And um, yeah, she died yesterday morning. And so that's just like, that's so fresh and really painful to wrap my head around the reality that she's not coming back. You know, this is someone I've lived next door to for the three and a half years that I've been in this home. And 
my roommates have lived next door to for 12 years. So it really like hit the reality of it hit in a new way yesterday because I've had people in my life have COVID, but this is the first person who was even in critical condition from it. Um, and it also feels like it was inevitable in a way, right? That it would eventually feel so personal with what, like 70,000 cases in the city. Um, so that's like, that's most at the forefront, <laughs> you know, like what I'm experiencing, like just grief. And, and simultaneously, I'm experiencing like a tremendous amount of gratitude. And it's wild how they can like just come so coupled, right? Like I have the amazing gift of being a New Yorker with a backyard. <laughs> and that is like the, the gift of that is not lost on me. I have a garden that I've been tending, we've been tending to like herbs and we've been starting tomatoes and cucumbers and salad greens and some echinacea and chamomile. Um, so like I have that, my, as you know, my partner moved in like in the midst of all of this. <laughs> we just been fucking crazy. <laughs> Um, and such a gift, like it's such a wild time to make that shift in a relationship. And I'm grateful that it's going really well. I have amazing housemates. And so, yeah, I'm experiencing a lot of, um, a lot of like love and comfort at home. Simultaneous to the tremendous pain. Within Extinction Rebellion, we've been having conversations about how best to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's challenging to find the lesson that it's offering us. And sometimes it's hard to focus on anything but the profound loss of life. What meaning are you deriving from this and what lessons is it giving you? I have been trying not to make meaning of it so much. And I think, you know, as something I know from my coaching work is that as human beings, we really, really hate uncertainty. Like the human brain hates uncertainty so much that we would rather believe something that is wrong than not know. And knowing this, my practice has been to just be in the complete uncertainty of it like what the fuck is going to happen to our world what will it look like on the other side when will we get to come out of our houses what's going to happen to our government and economy how will we grieve this how will we heal the trauma of this together i don't freaking know the answer to any of those questions but the, one of the greatest lessons out of all of this for me has been that like i um don't get to know how this is going to play out. I don't get to know how it's going to affect me personally. I don't get to know what's going to do to my world. Yeah, I just feel, I feel it so clearly that like my job is just to feel it and to relax into it to the extent that I know how. I had a conversation with Joanna Macy a couple weeks ago on the phone. And for a long time, she taught about the great turning as um, this something that we could kind of like build a bridge to build the bridge and walk over it. And then in the last two years, she's been more in a more concerted way, acknowledging that unraveling will likely need to happen as a part of the great turning, right? As a part of a transition to a life-sustaining society. And so I don't, I don't think she always saw it as inevitable, but I think in, in the world as it is now, I believe it's inevitable that we won't get to 
building new ways of life without probably a lot of pain and destruction. Any system, any being has to un become what it is in order to become what it will be. We shed and fall apart in order to become new. And as humans, we hate death and we hate ending. But that is part of, it doesn't make it fun. It doesn't make it, you know, any less painful. But it is just, a, it's true, right? Death and endings are part of all natural processes. I guess what I'm saying is that it was really helpful for me to be reminded by Joanna to, to see the earth at work in this and to see myself as a part of the earth, right? And so like as, a, as an ecological being, as a microcosm of this meta system that is being altered by what's happening in the world right now, that the best thing I can do is to to ride it to surrender to it to um not resist so in this time that can feel like an apocalypse what are you hearing from the people you coach and how are you helping them through this so one of the main themes in my work with my clients recently is um seeing first what is most meaningful to them right we all have these things that in my coaching model we call life's intentions and they are the things that we want to be known for the things that we want to know that our life is for right that like at the end of our lives we can look back and say yes these were all the moments that i was um a loving partner that i was a contributor to my community that I was a successful artist, right? These things that give meaning to our lives. And there's no end point in any of them, right? Like there's no point where we just like check the box and be like, yep, done it, I was a successful artist. I'm off the hook now. We spend our whole lives demonstrating these things. And I have been working with clients to recenter their attention on those things and to find small ways to demonstrate those things. And that brings a tremendous ease to people because your life's intentions can't be taken away, right? They are still, they are always there. And another thing that I think is really powerful about them is because they are so deeply essential to who we are um, that even in the midst of like a like psychological storm, right, where our like thoughts are bouncing off the walls because we're anxious, because our brains really don't like the uncertainty of what's happening in the world, um, or we're riding the emotional roller coaster, like I've described that I've been doing, that like even while that's happening, there is a truth about who we are that lies still, relatively still. Like I can picture like a, like a calm lake underneath it. And that, that is the essence of who we are and what's most important to us and what we're here to contribute to the world. So the task, if this metaphor is making sense, is to kind of reach through the storm, reach through the thoughts and feelings and connect to what's most, what's most meaningful and who we are. And when people do that, they connect to, um, or when people can reach through that and act and enact something that's important to them, they connect to a part of themselves that gives them the experience of being who they really are, right? And that is so calming to our systems and so satisfying, right? And it doesn't, it's not going to look the way it would have looked, right? Like right now, being a loving, loving child looks like just ringing up your mom and ask her how she's doing for a lot of people. That's all they can do. Something else that I've been talking to clients a lot about is just telling them something that's true for me, which is that my capacity for things that are not my own physical and emotional well-being 
the emotional, psychological, physical well-being of the people that I live with and taking care of my clients, like the most basic thing that I can do for work, right? Which is just like tend to my people. Like I have very little capacity outside of that. And what I mean when I say capacity is like, yeah, I could do more, but not without stretching past what I can do with a sense of ease in myself. And I, I encourage people to, to just rest in that, that it's, you know, I tell, I, I tell people that about my own life because I think I've, I've never, I've yet to find a person who hasn't found that to be true in themselves. Right. And so it's comforting to remember, like we are all operating on lower capacity for, for certain things. Right. And, and that's okay. This is like, such an important moment to be gentle and just because you don't have the energy for to pour into a life's intention right now doesn't mean that it won't be there later it doesn't mean that it's not important to you it simply means that the current conditions of the world and your life are such that what is most authentic is for you to focus in a narrower on a narrower scope of things right Going to the grocery store can be a half a day, half a day endeavor at this point. If that comes before work, good, your priorities are probably in the right place. So you've been leading these active hope workshops, which offer a space for people to process climate grief. And there's a way in which the pain we feel, our grief can become a passage to seeing beauty in the world and reconnecting to all life. I have the sense that the world is waking up in a way that we haven't seen before. I think, I mean, what's true is that we're part of our world, right? And so our world is suffering immensely right now. And so we are all suffering with it because we're a part of it. So in this, in that way, what's happening right now is no, it's no different from climate grief, right? Like we almost do ourselves a disservice in a moment like this by drawing some sort of dichotomy between what's happening now and climate grief. Because what both of them mean is that we like suffer with a world that we are a part of that's in pain. This is a moment where we are shedding parts of our individual identity And that's making way for a larger ecological self, a lar- uh, an identity of ourselves as ecological beings. But that's like one of the tremendous gifts of this virus is that like, it doesn't take a whole lot to see that we are all completely interconnected right this thing that has taken over the planet started with one person and one pangolin right (laughs) and and the whole world has been affected by it like hopefully anyone who's looking at that is seeing like wow i am so deeply connected to that person or that pangolin or bad or i haven't been following exactly what the story is but like there's we can't be separated, especially in a globalized world. So I, I mean, I hope that that's the, I hope that that's the lesson that people are taking away, right? And and if so, what a boon to the tremendous challenge that we have ahead of us as we continue to fight the climate crisis, that people might have their eyes open a little more. That their what they do matters <laughs> and what they don't do matters these moments where we have this like acute pain and acute threat all of a sudden we are so much more aware of the fact that we have to help each other that we have to share our resources in not equal but equitable ways and that those who are the most vulnerable right like we are as strong as our most vulnerable people 
whether that lesson will stick around, I have no idea. I don't know what it will take for people's eyes to stay open to these truths when this is over. And I think a lot of that depends on how the, how the systems we depend on are fundamentally changed as a result of this. Thank you for listening to With Love and Rage. This production, like all of Extinction Rebellion, is powered entirely by volunteers. And now we'd like to leave you with some words from Jess's teacher, Joanna Macy. If the world is to be healed through human efforts, I'm convinced it will be by ordinary people, people whose love for this life is even greater than their fear, people who can open to the web of life that called us into being. You don't need to do everything. Do what calls your heart. Effective action comes from love. It is unstoppable. And it is enough. This is a dark time filled with suffering and uncertainty. Like living cells in a larger body, it is natural that we feel the trauma of our world. So don't be afraid of the anguish you feel or the anger or fear, because these responses arise from the depth of your caring and the truth of your interconnectedness with all beings. The heart that breaks open can contain the whole universe.